Okay, move out. American Legion Convention in Boston. Processing meat and fish for U.S. troop mealtime. Another award for the most decorated Army aviator in Vietnam. A work camp for repatriated Viet Cong. The job of a harbor pilot in Quignon Bay. And the story of the South Vietnam National Railroad. The first cavalry division in action in this issue of Your Army Report. At the Fort Devens, Massachusetts Army Airfield, the National Security Commission Committee of the American Legion views U.S. Army aircraft and helicopters as part of this year's National Legion Convention being held in nearby Boston. Displayed are the all-purpose light aviation Beaver and versatile, battle-proven UH-1D Huey. Flying crane and small reconnaissance copters. The heavy-duty troop and supply helicopter, the workhorse of the U.S. Army in Vietnam, the CH-47 Chinook, is one of the main attractions for the visitors. Later, the committee views a realistic mock-up of a Viet Cong village used for training purposes at Fort Devens. During the visit, the group is briefed on enemy tactics, booby traps, and captured weapons in the training area which has been set up by the Army Security Agency. Next stop of the tour is the firing range, where the guests have a chance to brush up on old marksmanship skills using the new M16 and M14 rifles of today's fighting men. The following day, the committee visits the famous Natick Laboratories of the U.S. Army Materiel Command. Here, they receive first-hand, tasty information about the Army Food Irradiation Program, which, by a special process, enables food to be preserved for long periods. Support equipment and clothing is tested and developed for every predictable task in every environment. Visitors also view the latest fashions in airborne clothing, but the traditional high point of any American Legion convention is the parade, and the 49th National Convention is no exception. Everyone loves a parade, and what spectator does not feel a quickening pulse and a surge of pride as our national colors and United States troops pass proudly by. U.S. Army missile hardware, such as the versatile Hawks ground-to-air missiles, are on display. Woman warriors, too, have their moment. Fit and polished, a United States Marine Band and Color Guard flashes smartly by to a foot-tapping military march.
The Navy is also on deck in spotless dress whites for the occasion. As is a unit representing the United States Air Force, together with part of their bag of missile tricks. Army might shows more of its muscle to deter a would-be aggressor in the form of the mighty Nike Hercules missile and the more conventional jeep-mounted 106mm recoilless rifles. Shades of the Continental Army, a colorful reminder of the past, adds to the snap and sparkle of the participating groups. Legionnaires, ex-soldiers, show off their marching style. Then the many school and civic units add their contribution to making the day's parade a memorable one. But the biggest applause of the day from the receptive onlookers who line the streets is given this group of returned Vietnam veterans. World War I flying ace Roscoe Turner shows he can stay in the saddle and tame a mechanical horse, which is part of the hijinks fun. Every state in the Union is represented in some way during the eight-hour parade, plus some south of the border places. At the reviewing stand is a float from far off Hawaii, adding its exclusive exotic touch. Young and old extend a special welcome to the traditional figure of Uncle Sam during the colorful Boston American Legion National Convention Parade. Believe it or not, this is an army fish story. These freshly caught haddock have had it. In Gloucester, Massachusetts, the haddock begin the careful selective processing, which eventually land them on a soldier's dinner plate. At a local commercial fish company, specialists of the United States Army Veterinary Food Service Office, located in Boston, begin their checking and supervision of every step of the way, from catch to fillet to packaged final product. First, moving along a conveyor belt, the fish are systematically processed and filleted. An expert in his field screens the fresh fish for evidence of unacceptable condition. The Army rejects any substandard food. Accepted fillets are placed in trays and are quick frozen into blocks in order to maintain their freshness, taste, and nutritional value. The frozen fillet blocks are then sliced into strips under the watchful eyes of a food specialist. These strips are placed in a machine which cuts them into individual portions and are once again inspected for standardized requirements. Unique mechanization methods speed the fillet into the batter and breading machine. Regulation of the required exact weight and texture is determined at the next step of the process, and later the fillets will be pre-cooked slightly. The properly prepared and accepted portions are then boxed under rigid sanitary conditions. A final weigh-in and the boxes will soon be on their way to Army Mess Hall. 
The proof of the pudding is in the eating. And what do you think the food specialist has for lunch? You guessed it. Another operation of the Army Veterinary Food Services is responsible for the meat and potatoes of a soldier's menu. At a government contracted food packing company, sea ration items of meat and potatoes are processed from raw stage through packaging for the U.S. fighting man. Continual supervision of the food handling is evident during the deboning process of the carcasses. Army specialists check for quality at various stages from carcass to steak fillet. Systematically, equal portions of exactly three pieces of choice beef are placed into every sea ration can. Gravy and peeled and cleaned potatoes are added. The contents are then cooked. Before a shipment is prepared, boxes are marked which will be opened and the cans inside inspected. Dented cans and cans with leaking seams are rejected. Pressurization is also checked. A final army quality control ensures exact consistency of mixture and the seasoning of the gravy, meat, and potato combination. The contents of a can is poured into a strainer. Then the meat is taken out and weighed and inspected for impurities. as are the potatoes. Tasty and balanced meals for the diet of the American soldier, courtesy of the U.S. Army Veterinary Food Service. At Soc Trang, South Vietnam, men of the U.S. Army 13th Aviation Battalion witnessed the awarding of Distinguished Service Crosses to two of their pilots by Army Chief of Staff General Harold K. Johnson, on hand to make the important presentation. The Distinguished Service Cross is the nation's second highest award for gallantry in action. The honored aviators move smartly front and center to receive their decorations from General Johnson. The first award will be given to Chief Warrant Officer Jerome R. Daly, the most decorated Army pilot of the Vietnam conflict. As a National Guardsman in Washington, Pennsylvania, Warrant Officer Daly volunteered for service in Vietnam in July 1964, and since that time has received the Silver Star, three Distinguished Flying Crosses, another DSC, and many other medals. Both men have logged thousands of hours as armed helicopter pilots in Vietnam. Next, Warrant Officer Jack E. Griver accepts his award with a hearty handshake of congratulations from the General. After the official ceremonies are over, General Johnson talks informally with the men of the battalion about their significant role in the Vietnam conflict and the maintenance of a free way of life for the Vietnamese people. The 13th Aviation Battalion, a proud outfit of seasoned soldiers receiving the recognition they justly deserve from their Army Chief of Staff. The Chu Hui, or Open Arms Center, near San Lac, is typical of many such places throughout South Vietnam, where former Viet Cong guerrilla fighters get the opportunity of starting a new life. Sentry post and sandbag positions are still evident in the village, and within simple buildings, the Chu Hoys run their own farms, which incorporate modern techniques. Funds made available by the U.S. Agency for International Development help in the purchase of livestock. Another example of learning and enterprise 
is the salvage of U.S. Army lumber and sheet metal for the repair of temporary buildings used for training and indoctrination of former V.C., enabling them to re-enter the Vietnamese society. A sign in the compound outside the main structure indicates the value given each former Viet Cong when he turns in his weapon to the Republic of Vietnam forces. The Chu Hoys have an opportunity to learn several skills in this workshop. A sign nearby has a slogan that a man loves his home, country, and family. After a 60 to 90 day stay at the center, the Chu Hoi may return with his family to a military secured area or join an armed propaganda team in order to urge former comrades to rally to the government side. A newly repaired water pump helps symbolize in a small way the hope for these men and their families of a fuller, healthier, and more satisfying way of life in the Republic of Vietnam. Thanks to another assistance program from America. Quy is a fast-growing port and depot complex about 300 miles northeast of Saigon, which serves as a major storage and supply facility for United States forces in the Central Highlands area. In Quy Bay, harbor pilots of the U.S. Army Transportation Corps, 5th Transportation Command, guide incoming and outgoing vessels through the navigable channel dredged along the shallow shoreline. Working together on the bridge of each ship are the Vietnamese and U.S. Army harbor pilots who, with the captain, instruct the ship's helmsman as to speed and direction of approach to the harbor and pier areas. A transistorized walkie-talkie system facilitates the close coordination between U.S. Army tugboats, harbor pilots, and the vessel as it maneuvers toward the floating DeLong pier which juts out from the shore. Prior to the piers being built, all offloading was accomplished using small craft. Now, up to seven large ships may be docked at the same time by placing them two abreast and discharging cargo at the end of the pier using a specially designed ramp. The harbor pilots, ship's captain, and the tugboats combine their coordinated seamanship efforts as they ease the fully loaded vessel toward the floating dock. As soon as the ship is secured at the pier, the harbor pilots leave the ship until the vessel is ready to depart the port. Once at the dock, the heavy harbor schedule calls for fast ship turnaround time, and cargo unloading proceeds rapidly. In the vast scope of U.S. Army operations, the special breed of harbor pilot continues to render their unique contribution toward keeping Kenyon Harbor active and our troops well supplied in Vietnam. Each week, large shipments of military cargo arrive at Saigon in the Republic of Vietnam. Offloaded at the docks, vital supplies for our soldiers must be moved to the combat zones with the least possible delay. Getting the cargo to its destination in a country where movement is impeded by a dense interior and lack of adequate transportation facilities is a difficult and challenging assignment. To relieve the pressure on trucks and cargo planes, the Vietnamese National Railway System is increasing its cargo carrying operations. Because there are no rail facilities currently available at the new Saigon port area, cargo is moved out by truck to a railhead on the outskirts of the city. Here, forklift trucks are used to load the supplies aboard the freight cars.
About 1,500 tons of cargo a month are carried by the trains to U.S. military bases near the rail line northeast of Saigon. The shipments include mail, medical supplies, clothing, and food for our soldiers. This cargo, destined for men of the 1st Infantry Division, contains a complete menu right down to dessert. All crates and boxes are checked carefully, and an inventory is taken of everything that is put aboard the train. After loading, the doors of the car are locked and sealed. An armored railway car carrying Vietnamese security troops is included in the makeup of the train. Armed with rifles and machine guns, these forces will provide fire support in the event of a Viet Cong attack. Advisory personnel from the U.S. Army Transportation Corps are on hand to coordinate the operations. Radio contact is maintained with the railroad dispatchers and with allied military units in the region. There are 80 miles of usable track from Saigon into the interior. The three U.S. installations along the way are serviced by the railroad, and the complete run takes about five hours. Sometimes the speed of the train is cut to as little as three miles an hour through enemy infested areas. Viet Cong booby traps along the route can cause heavy damage and delay. Pushed ahead of the train by the engine, flatbed cars serve as minesweepers to detonate any pressure type explosives that may have been placed on the track. Picking up additional cars en route, the train arrives at its destination and is shunted onto a siding for unloading. The much needed supplies are lifted off the cars by waiting transportation crews. Swift and efficient management of cargo traffic is required at each transfer point to make certain that the cargo is handled skillfully and with the greatest possible safety. Under close supervision of the transportation experts, the supplies are reloaded onto trucks for the last lap of the trip to the particular base camp nearby. With each vehicle utilized to carry maximum load, the convoy of trucks is moved speedily out of the railroad yard, and the precious cargo is on its way to our fighting men. The empty freight cars are assembled for return to the Saigon Rail Depot, where more cargo is awaiting pickup. Plans for the future of the Vietnam National Railway System call for the extension and expansion of facilities which will help make the dense interior regions of the country more accessible. At the Vinh Thanh United States Special Forces Camp in the Central Highlands of Vietnam, Officers of the 1st Air Cavalry Division, Air Mobile, hold a briefing session with Arvin commanders while planning a joint operation in the Anlo Valley. The plan is to utilize a combat technique using a new concept in tactics in order to flush out Viet Cong guerrilla fighters in the surrounding mountainous terrain. A specialist in the 229th Aviation Battalion checks out powerful floodlights mounted on UH-1D helicopters used to seek out the enemy. At dawn, these unusually equipped Hueys, dubbed Fireflies, are fully loaded with battle-ready advance reconnaissance patrols. They speed toward their planned landing zone in the neighboring valley. 
The rising sun provides a dramatic beginning for the day's operations deep in enemy territory. During the early morning at the base, backup gunships are prepared with rockets and other armament for the assigned mission. When all is ready, the crews make their final flight checks and the troops load for takeoff. over the deceivingly peaceful looking valleys of the region, the gunships are on the alert for any ground activity. Smoke markers set off by the forward dawn reconnaissance unit indicate points of enemy concentration to be attacked. Then the gunships move in and open up with machine gun and rocket fire to neutralize the VC stronghold. Explosions and mushrooms of billowing smoke attest to the accuracy and strength of the devastating air assault. The ships continue to circle, looking for the fleeing Viet Cong as they press the attack. Not far away, the circling copters find an open spot suitable for landing where the waiting U.S. and Arvin scouts can be picked up and returned to their base camp. Mission accomplished. The American troops swap first-hand reports with the Republic of Vietnam soldiers about sweep and clear operations to secure the Central Highlands region. Their rotor blades still turning, the copters stand on the landing zone as the troops are loaded. American and Arvin know-how and determination have pressed the night and day successful pursuit of an elusive enemy. Once again, air mobility, ingenuity and cooperation prove themselves in the Vietnam fight.